everyone, and welcome to Lisi's News, Views, and To-Dos, where we talk with legal industry professionals about what's going on in their world, how they see our industry evolving and changing, and what their advice is for our audience. Today, I am so beyond thrilled to have with me Patrick Fuller, who is Vice President and General Manager at ALM Intelligence. Um, Patrick, is before I actually introduce him, I'm going to say Patrick is my favorite person for two reasons. One, we are both huge data nerds and get very nerdy about numbers, which is kind of fun. And two, Patrick is a huge advocate of women supporting women. When I've been doing, you know, my whole shtick on um, LinkedIn about Follow Friday and women supporting women, Patrick is my number one cheerleader and always really um, passionate about what I'm doing there. So I owe him a debt of gratitude. So Patrick, thank you so much for being on the on with me today. <laughs> uh, I, it's, it's an absolute pleasure. And thank you very much for having me. And, and I appreciate, uh, as you and I have discussed, I appreciate the work that you are doing to, to bring awareness around those issues because we're far from done with that. Mm. I know we could probably do an entire episode, like an hour and a half, just about that one topic, but we'll save that for another time. (laughs) So I'm going to ask you my first question, which I um, mentioned to you before we started recording. I just learned that apparently I say this in a funny way, but my first question is what's news with you? What's going on in your world? Well, and and I told you I would would answer it like I was from Wisconsin, like the way that we do is with you guys up there all the time. Um, uh, No, so there's a lot going on, actually. It's been uh, this last year has been really interesting um, because when you stop traveling, you find more time to do more stuff. And so um, so a couple of things inside ALM, which is who I work for, uh, we, we we made a decision. It was rather difficult uh, last June to take a business that was called consulting intelligence. And, and it was made up of uh, very smart analysts, a lot of whom had backgrounds in the management consulting industry who would do a lot of work around market sizing and evaluations and ratings um, using different uh, uh, qualitative and quantitative models of uh, various service offerings from the consultancies and advisory um, uh, companies. We made the decision, uh, it's about a 50-year-old company, to, to change the direction of that business. And so we discontinued that um, organization, which was called uh, Consulting Intelligence. And we launched something called Paysetter Research. And the reason that we, we did that was we started looking at the market and seeing that there was a lot of convergence of professional services providers. So not just that the big four was coming into legal or that you know we're seeing more of the management consulting, the McKinsey's and the BCG's and the Bain's coming into legal departments uh, as well. But the way that they were approaching, you know, when you would look at discrete problems, things such as cybersecurity or around strategic sourcing or m and you know, we had these providers that were coming at the same solution in different ways. And we wanted to look at how um, those providers were, were bringing some of that innovation to market. And more importantly than what it meant for each of the markets, what did the market look like and where, you know, what is the market map for these services? And uh, Tomek Yankowski and uh, uh, Liz DeVito um, helped launch this. Uh, two analysts, and you know, Liz, longtime background um, in uh, with Mercer and other organizations in workforce management. Tomek in the financial advisory space. Um, Liz helped us launch it. Um, she stayed on an extra year before she retired, and she she earned you know worked her tail off in her career and earned the retirement. We were lucky and fortunate to bring in Chrissy Robertson. Um, who was late of Manzama and has just got a incredible background. And so Christy has now taken off on that. And that's, that's really building uh, the feedback that we're getting, especially from the big four and the advisory side is, is great. It's not a pay for play. We do a lot of qualitative research uh, in through this and there, we do a lot of interviews and the analysts are very, very good at breaking down the market and looking at, you know, who are the pace setters, who are the market leaders. And we have an advisory council that we've established of from everything from GCs to consultants uh, globally um, and people on the financial advisory side that are giving us advice as who we should talk to and why and and who are really driving innovation in the market. So that's been a big change. And then the other is that we launched Law.com Pro inside ALM. And, you know, that's, that's great. I get to work with you know, somebody I know, you know, uh, Gina Passarella, and I get to work very closely with Gina, who is incredible. And we do a lot of work marrying together the editorial side and the data side that is this offering that includes, you know, the intelligence products like Legal Compass and 
Wa.com. And then there's a lot of stuff that's behind the scenes or exclusive features and data sets that go into Law.com Pro. And that's been a real huge undertaking for us. And then probably the two other things that would fall into the news category. And since you mentioned news with plural, I had to go with more than one. Um, <laughs> but, but the other two things I think really away from ALM, one is the Cairo project, which I know you're familiar with as well too. And that's um, Jen Bankston and um, Heather McCullough and Jill Hughes to put this together. And, and that's really that's an incredible platform. And we're involved with it in the pace of research side a little bit too, by helping them with some surveys. And it's, it's really just, you know, it's a mission to create effective women leaders by applying, you know, really humanitarian values to the workplace and teaching the adoption of, of complement of uh, really complementary uh, disciplines and empowering strong female leaders. And that's something I think is uh, necessary inside organizations. And we have to continue shining a light on it. And then the other is the changing legal organization that I was lucky enough to be a founding member, uh, board member of. And that is really geared towards, you know, taking on some of the long held challenges and barriers to change within legal, you know, things like the billable hour and looking for ways to move beyond that and change the market for the better. And there's a strong diversity component in with that as well. So it's been a, a busy year, both internal to the organization and external as well. You have so much news. You have so much going on. <laughs> and actually, I'm going to go back up to, to Paysetter and some of the ALM stuff for a second, because sure. um, I read an interesting article today just talking about on the marketing side of things, you know, 10 years ago, big data was supposed to revolutionize the way that marketing organizations handled their campaigns, handled their initiatives and strategies, and that, you know, here we are 10 years later, and there are a small percentage of organizations that have really matured in their data collection and analysis and, uh, you know, implementation of, of results and findings. And I'm curious if in the research that you're doing with Paysetter and across ALM, are you finding that when you're finding these leaders in the market, is it really a small percentage? And there's still a lot of uh, firms and organizations that are struggling to kind of catch up or what is that maturity spectrum in terms of some of the best practices you're finding? I think it's, you know, it's a really interesting question. I think it's driven a lot by the, by the industry and the adoption um, within it. I, legal is always a little bit late to the party in that despite being a wash in data um, in through there, you know, the, the marketing, the metrics and things, you know, along those lines and the data that's associated for, for marketing purposes, you know, that's been a huge component of, you know, for example, AdAge and their CMO database uh, for many years now. And there is a lot more information on that. But within legal, because it's such a finite audience and you're appealing to a different audience, I think it's we're a little bit slower in some mm -hmm. respects to really embrace a lot of that. You know, the other part that's really interesting is how, you know, for us, the data is, is more driven around, you know, how buyers use it and what they're looking at and how, you know, they will use data to evaluate providers and how law firms are utilizing it for pricing or to assess what markets they should go into or they're evaluating laterals and things like this. I think the thing that's really interesting in the last 10 years is that I've seen is that there's a greater acceptance by buyers of legal services to utilize a lot of data that, that they have had now for about 10 to 15 years um, where there's a significant history where they know how long matters are going to last. They know how much they should cost. They know how they should be staffed and what's optimal. Uh, but a lot of that was all driven by fee engagements that were billable hour related to where it's not always the most efficient, but they have a baseline for what everything should be. And I think it makes the challenges of marketers then a little bit more difficult because now you have an audience that has pre predetermined expectations around what should be, how it should be priced, how it should be sold, what the value of it is. And I think that's what made this last year really unique in many ways is that um, a lot of the legal needs shifted from, you know, where it was typically run the company work as, as we refer to it. There was a lot of things that were brought on the by the pandemic that we, we got into a, an area where it was not things that we had as, a lot of historical data on and organizations we're kind of back to where they were 10, 15 years ago, where they were working without a lot of data when they were procuring services. And so I think, you know, it, if anything, this last year drove home the need for greater adoption and usage of data uh, in everything that we, that we do. Yeah, I can, I, 
I mean, you know me, as I said at the top of this, I'm a, I'm a huge data nerd. So uh, the more that we can utilize and leverage that data, it's kind of like what we were saying before, you know, if, if everybody has that education and that understanding and is able to use it, how much more advanced could we be? Obviously that conversation was in a different context, but it applies here. How much more advanced, how much further along could we be in this process and how much more could we serve our clients on, you know, all in every sense of that? Sentence. Yeah. And I think you know, this will be something we'll probably hit on a little bit later too, but I think what it'll do is it makes the, the internal sales process, I think a little bit easier, right? Because the one thing that, you know, data became my best friend years ago because it enabled me to sell more effectively. And, and you know, so that's, it really, it became something that was, I hate to say like a differentiator or a secret weapon, but it was what makes it what made that difficult is that I was coming from a perspective where I had to be really good at presenting the data in a way that everybody else could consume it to understand it. Now, mm -hmm. if we start utilizing the data more effectively and, and more people start buying into it, and this is what we're seeing with a lot of um, you know, startups, for example, away from legal, or we're seeing it within law firms with younger attorneys who are coming up and they're used to making more data-driven decisions, is that now you don't have to sell as different because they're looking at the same information and drawing similar conclusions to it. And so, you know, creating that shift um, in strategy or facilitating change becomes a little bit easier when you've got an audience that is already prepped a little bit or is, is bought into the notion of utilizing the data to make decisions. And so mm -hmm. I think that's where we'll see the greatest impact in, in years to come is that as this continues to gain acceptance, we are going to, it's going to be a little bit easier for people who are driving really smart strategic change inside organizations to have, you know, to sell that, those initiatives internally. Whereas before you really had to figure out interesting ways of presenting data differently to different people because of how they process information and how they buy into things. And that's what made it difficult. You and I can look at spreadsheets and we can probably see shapes that pop out of it. Whereas sometimes when we're presenting to a certain audience, we've got to create very explicit visuals in order for them, for that data to really, the point that we want to make really to hit home with it. And I think that is in part because there's only one side that has access or is bought into the use of that data. That I think is what's slowly changing right now. But you're right that we're going to touch on that because that sort of leads me straight into my next question, you know, in terms of how you see the industry evolving and sort of what is the impact, the impact of those changes, obviously data it is going to have a huge impact in people's fluency with data and understanding of it, but also, so, you know, more on that to the degree you have more thoughts on that, but also what should be changing in the legal industry and is probably going to take longer than we'd like. Well, the last question is the easiest one, and that's probably going to be compensation structure, because I think, you know, you would probably agree with this, given, you know, experiences in-house as well, too. I mean, it's, it does, and it's not, and to be very clear, be very fair, it's not just related to lawyers. I mean, in any organization, if you have salespeople that you put a sales contract or a sales compensation plan out there, you, you are incentivizing very specific behavior. Um, mm -hmm. Variable compensation drives very explicit behavior. I used to when I would work with legal departments and we would go in sometimes that we'd have conversations around, you know, okay, are you looking at, do you want lower rates or do you want lower, lower total matter costs? And you would hear, well, no, we just were interested in lowering the rate. You kind of got a pretty good idea at that point, how they were being compensated from a variable comp perspective, right? It's like, Hey, if you lower the rates a certain percentage, this is part of your, your variable comp. I think for legal, the biggest thing that has to change in order for other things to change is that the compensation structure has to change. It's very difficult for us to say, well, we want to move to uh, fixed fee billing and we want to be more efficient, but yet our compensation system is really driven more towards utilization and hitting billable hour targets. Mm -hmm. You know, well, we want to bring automation and we want to make better use of innovation and technology. It's like, well, that's great, but then that has to align with the fee arrangement, which then has to align with the compensation structure. And so I think a lot of that comes down to compensation. And we've seen it in recent years. Uh, Tim Corcoran's really good at this with a lot of his uh, work on, on compensation structure and, and, and benefits and, and pension and, or you're really getting into the post-retirement aspect. And that is, is when you're going through succession, you know, putting together, um, you know, the types of incentives that will, inhib that, that will enable, you know, smooth transition of, you know, clients that are not impacting the, the revenue and the profitability of that client. Uh, and so I think it, a lot of it comes back to the behaviors that we're looking to incentivize and how we go about doing it. So I think that's the thing 
that I think is probably, you know, needs to change, but it's probably going to take the longest to change. Um, you know, as far as the industry, you know, I'm a, and you're probably very familiar with this, but I'm a huge um, believer in Porter's Five Forces. I'm a huge believer in Porter's Five Forces. And I've written a lot about this. I've spoken a lot about it. I think it's, it's really interesting because legal has dealt with a lot of this you know, if you, if you think about it sort of on an access, you know, and for those that are familiar with, with Porter's Five Forces, Michael Porter um, is a professor at Harvard who in 1979 wrote a book called Competitive Strategy. And within that book, he outlined the five market forces that shape and influence strategy. And, you know, basically what it was, was you have an industry rivalry that things go around. And then if you think of it sort of like a, um, a compass where you have East and West on either axis, you would have the bargaining power of suppliers and the bargaining uh, power of, uh, of buyers. And then on the North and South, you would have the threat of new entrants. And then the bottom would be the, you know, the threat of substitute products or services. And legal has always dealt with the industry rivalry. We've always mm-hmm. dealt with that, right? Firms compete with firms, you know, companies compete with companies, the, the vendors, the vendors compete with each other, the West, the Lexus, the Bloomberg, right? Uh, that, that stuff's always been there. We've always had new entrants. We've had spinoff firms. We've had new mergers. We've had, you know, you Two firms merge and there's a couple of groups that are conflicted out. They go out, they form their own group. We're seeing a lot more of that now, actually, with spinoffs from larger firms that are putting together newer firms that are attacking the market in different ways. They're doing comp different. They're incentivizing different. So we've always dealt with that. The one thing that legal has never really dealt with that others have, and we were talking before we started filming a little bit about Blockbuster, and it's, that's always a great example with this, is that threat of substitute products or services. Mm-hmm. And so when you see... You know, whether it's the ASPs that are coming in or the big four and their use of, of efficiency driving um, automation and, you know, compensation driven more by, you know, through efficiency than utilization. Or I think, you know, one of the big things uh, that will, you know, we'll end up seeing is pure automation. So things like legalmation, uh, which are, which is really doing a lot of work to automate, you know, in their case, um, the initial uh, response to, that they started first with single plaintiff employment filings and they would automate that response. And you're starting to see the legal departments, you know, say, okay, you know what, it's actually, if you prefer us to do this, then utilize outside counsel for this. That's the sort of stuff that I think really is, should be a little bit more worrisome. I don't think it's ever going to take away the bet, the business. It's probably not going to take away the bet, the bonus work anytime Mm -hmm. soon, but it's some of that run the company work that a lot of, um, firms rely on in part to, for, for the younger lawyers in part to just sort of, you know, if you think of a baseball analogy, it's the singles that keep you going station to station, you know, it's that sort of work that, that separates, you know, decent years from very good years in some years, just because of demand and keep, and everybody's hitting their, their targets. That's the thing I think is really probably going to be the biggest change. And we've seen it a little bit more in the UK. We've seen it in Australia. I think that's, it forces firms to compete a little bit differently as well, too. And so that probably is the one with, within Porter that I think will be the biggest, the biggest driver of change here will be that threat of substitute products and services that becomes more real as time goes on. Yeah, I, it's an interesting point because I have been saying, so I've been in legal for oh, 15 years. And so, um, you know, I lived through the financial crisis and, um, you know, various other sort of things that have been happening over the past 10 years. And my biggest takeaway, and I was much more junior in my career during the financial crisis, but my biggest takeaway from that was just the evolution of exactly what you're saying. Those sort of I'm going to call it routine and that's probably not the right word, but routine, you know, keep the, keep the doors open, keep the company, you know, working. That type of work is going into these in-house departments that are growing much larger because it's more cost-effective for these corporations to have their own legal team in-house. They don't need 47, you know, different providers across a panel. Um, And there's so many, you know, forces here. I talk about this with Melissa Prince, who's the, chief client value and innovation officer at Ballard. I talk about it with her all the time. You know, how are we able to exactly to your point, how are firms able to create a structure and create a, a plan for how to service their clients in an efficient and cost-effective way, but also provide that, that client value and that client service. Um, And 
I always sort of joke, you know, I listen to Melissa and, and to a certain degree, I listen to you talk. I'm, I, I get what you're saying, but it's sort of is these large concepts that are, they're so almost too hard to like wrap your hands around because they, these challenges feel insurmountable to me. You know, how do you take a behemoth of an industry like legal and completely change the way people feel about doing business, you know? Yeah, and it's not sometimes about the, and Melissa's brilliant. I love listening to her speak. And, and she, you know, she's been at the forefront of a lot of this. You know, I remember, you know, seeing her speak for the first time years ago at, at the P3 conferences. And, mm -hmm. and when she was talking about a lot of this, I think, you know, one of the things that you will see is, is really with repetitive knowledge tasks. That's kind of the low hanging fruit. And there's a lot of, there's not a lot, but there's, there's aspects of law that are very rules based. And so it sets up very well for automation. And it also creates an atmosphere where you don't necessarily need perfect, you need good. And mm -hmm. so we would see that thing, you know, see so if you think about things such as regulatory, you know, certain regulatory or compliance aspects, or, you know, a big one um, that you'll see is the do's and don'ts with country uh, rules for investment bankers and things like this, where you don't necessarily need global law firms doing that work or a 50 state survey done by, you know, ABC law firm, you can go to an ASP and you can have those, you know, the underlying legal opinions and that work done at a fraction of the cost. And then you build a self-service automation tool that allows you to scale the expertise of your lawyers. And at the same time, you know, ask questions um, in a way, you know, so it's, it's a self-serve application that pushes this work back into the business but you're scaling the legal expertise. And I think that's something yeah. that that's really the low hanging fruit for a lot of that. And, you know, there's a lot of organizations that if you think about retailers, for example, just in the States and doing a 50 state survey. So grocery stores or um, big box retailers that are dealing with the various liquor laws, you know, that's a great example because, you know, where I, I live in the Southwest or I live in Oklahoma, so it gets us to central plains, but if you get down into Texas, they're, in Arkansas, there are still places that have uh, dry counties or parts of municipalities that are dry. And so your liquor laws, if you're a, a large, you know, big box retailer, you know, they're going to, the compliance that you have to have is going to be different, um, mm -hmm. you, you know, from municipality to state to, to city and, and county, et cetera. So having that underlying database where you're not constantly having to go back to people inside a legal department or a compliance office and get, you know, get approval and get sign off and, you know, everything else. Um, it makes it easier to do it once and, and spread it out to many. It's no different than when we're doing updates to operating systems. You know, we don't go computer to computer and rewrite the code on each computer. We do it once and we blast it out to everybody. Yeah. It's how we achieve economies of scale. And so I think that's the sort of stuff that will be low hanging fruit um, in many ways. We've seen it already with e-discovery. Uh, we'll see it more with due diligence in, in M&A deals. Um, and I think that there's, you know, we're seeing it now with things like traffic tickets and do not pay. And, you know, I think it's, it's, it's going to be a huge piece in the access to justice puzzle as well, because it's going to create accessibility to some form of, of scaled um, expertise uh, for people that ordinarily, you know, it's, they have a hard time getting in to see lawyers or affording lawyers. So I think that there's a lot of upside in through this, but I think, for a lot of firms, there are firms that are that are attacking it. I, I think appropriately, and they're looking at ways of building these these tools, and they're looking at ways of not practicing law differently, but how they deliver legal services to their to their buyers. And I think those are the firms that are are likely going to be a little bit more ahead of the game. Um, yeah, as more of this takes off. Yep, I completely agree with you. So my last question I like to ask everybody is. Um, and it's a really large question, which is, you know, what is your advice for our audience? We have our audience is legal marketers, lawyers, legal industry professionals of it, you know, any, any type. <laughs> so if you could either for everybody or sort of a subset of that group, what piece of advice would you like to share with our audience? I think, you know, for me, I mean, we, you're going to get a lot of advice around resilience, resiliency and curiosity. The number one thing I always look for when, when I bring people on is curiosity. I want people that are not afraid to, to get, go down those rabbit holes, uh, because I think that there's a, there's a great active discovery in, in through there. There's a Proust quote somewhere that comes to mind about the, 
the real act of discovery, I think, is not in finding new lands, but in seeing with new eyes. And I probably butchered mm -hmm. that six different ways to Sunday. I think the biggest skill uh, is probably twofold. One, so I think one is the ability to sell, but it's also understanding behavioral economics. Um, I think that's the one thing um, that has been probably most eye-opening to me in the last 10 years I've really gotten into is getting into behavioral economics and, and seeing things a little bit differently through a different lens when applying psychology to um, everyday situations. I think the, the number one skill period is the ability to sell internally. I don't care if you're in sales or you're not in sales. If you're selling ideas, if you're trying to change um, decisions, especially because we live in a world and most people that are watching this are going to work in legal where everything is based on precedent, right? Mm -hmm. Everything is based on precedent. So we've all heard that phrase repeatedly, which is, well, we've done that before and it didn't work. And uh, so I think that, you know, the ability to overcome that is, is critical for anybody. So, you know, what data, what information, what examples can you use? How do people process information? You know, this is really where a lot of the psychology comes in and the, and the behavioral economics component comes in. Um, you know, because the reality of it is, is nothing really starts until something is sold, right? So if you think about a lot of the work in legal, the contracts and things along those lines, even disputes around um, things, it deals in some point with, with a sale. The other part too, I think, and I, I bring this up a lot, but, and, you know, I picked it up years and years ago and kind of modified it over time, but people buy with emotion and justify with logic, right? So when mm. you know, John Cotter, the, the famous um, Harvard professor on change always talks about, you know, you have to connect with both the head and the heart. And I think that he's absolutely correct on that. You know, a lot of us buy with them with emotion and we self-rationalize, but the reality of it is, is that we also have to then deal with logic. And so I think that that's where, you know, and, and look, we do this intuitively selling legal services. So if you think about how a lot of buyers buy, it's like, well, do I like this person? And then eventually do we think we can trust this person? But then it's like, okay, so what's the logical justification? Well, here's our experience. So look at all this work that we've done handling similar matters. And that becomes the logical justification. And so I think for a lot of people selling internally, that's probably the biggest thing I would, I would tell them is, is understand that people buy with emotion and justify with logic, especially people when everything's based on precedent. You've got to appeal at some point to that logical component of it. So that's where data, that's where information, that's where research really becomes front and center in through that. And then the other part of it too is understand the motivating factor. I would, I would urge everybody to go read the book Nudge by Richard Thaler. I think it's brilliant. And I think it, you know, it, I, it hits on um, our profession so, so eloquently and so directly. Um, you know, where, you know, and we talk about this, you know, offline too, but, you know, even, you know, the notion that for many of the people that we, that we deal with, you know, the, the pleasure from gaining something is, is not nearly as great to them as the fear and the pain of losing something. Right. So there, we have too many people that are really motivated by fear, but they're, they're not motivated enough by, um, by the gain of something. And we deal with that all the time. If we go to a lawyer and say, Hey, you can change your, if you change this, this, and this about your behavior, you can make 10% more. And it's, you're talking to somebody that's already awake and making 1.5 to $2 million. You know, they're looking at it and saying, well, you know what, the work I have to do to change those two things is not worth, you know, the, the minimal gain that I'm going to get off of this. It's not going to change my life one way or the other. But if they lose that client, that's 60% of their book of business, that is a massive motivating change. And so understanding how people make decisions and what drives those decisions, I think is important. And the last thing I would say too is, is um, you know, invest a lot in courses on how to read people. I think one of the things that's really going to change, you know, we spent so many years, you know, in we've all done this before. You've done it. I've done it. We would get in conference rooms and immediately you're sizing up the room. And you're looking at people and you're understanding, okay, who's looking at who when I ask certain questions and based on their body language or based on what they're wearing, you know, can we get clues as to what's important to them? It's a lot harder with Zoom, especially when we're all looking yep. at the Brady Bunch screen and you can't really tell who's looking at who and who they're defaulting to. And if they're looking over here, is it because they're looking at something else or they're bored or do they have monitors on either side and they're just being distracted right now? So it changes how you read the room. So now it becomes more auditory based as opposed to visual based. And so I think those are the things that I would say moving forward, those, you know, that's what I want folks I work with really getting into a lot as well is, is learning how to adapt to the changing market, you know, always accounting for variable change and making sure that they're prepared to sort of be ahead of where things are going next. So understanding what drives decision-making, how to sell internally and, 
and really understanding how to read people um, yeah. now digitally as opposed to in person. Yeah, that's I, a lot. Sorry, it is a lot. <laughs> I was just thinking that is a lot of advice, <laughs> but it's really. It's really sage advice. I mean, those are, and I, you're going to think I'm, <laughs> I'm full of it, but I literally this morning was thinking how much, how frustrated I, frustrated I am by digital communication vehicles like Zoom, because I'm really good at reading body language. I can get into, I'm, you know, yes, I'm sizing up a room, but I can also tell when an idea that somebody has makes somebody uncomfortable, but they're not going to necessarily say that out loud. So figuring out how to give them a platform to, voice their opinion or disagree or whatever. I'm really, really good at that. I suck at it on Zoom. <laughs> and it's really hard, you know, and I truly just this morning was thinking, how can I leverage the thing that I'm good at and figure out how to do this digitally? Because I need to, I need to brush up on that skill. So I'm going to take that advice to heart. Um, and I'm absolutely going to put it to practice. And um, I know that there's so much valuable information in this interview. So I, I know our viewing audience is going to get a lot out of this conversation. Well, it's been, no, it's been a pleasure. And the, the one final thing I'll, I'll, I guess I'll end with too, is the one benefit that we've got, especially as we, you know, advance in careers and things like that is the diversity of opinion from everybody and the different experiences that everybody brings to the table. I found that to be um, probably one of the most rewarding things is in, in working with different people from different backgrounds is that the way that they, they look at, you know, they're seeing a lot of problems for the first time with, with new eyes where we've seen it, you know, repeatedly over the years and maybe we've become a little bit jaded about it. I think yeah. that's one of the biggest things is getting new perspectives on things and forcing you to look at information and, and do things a little bit differently. Um, I'm a huge, a huge proponent of getting um, consensus and getting, getting everybody's opinion on something because the one thing I've learned over my career is there's a lot that I don't know and presuming to know it is doing, you know, does nobody any good, but you know, learning it and, and getting those diverse opinions and getting different perspectives um, from people and, and their take on it. There's a ton of value in through that. And it probably facilitates more growth than anything else right now, because it opens your eyes to new possibilities. Yep. I couldn't agree more. That's a perfect way to end this conversation. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate your time. I know how busy you are. So thank you so much for oh, being on today. Awesome. Are you kidding me? This has been fun. So I appreciate it very much. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. Thanks so much.